think the way that we calculate AYP is fundamentally flawed and needs to be fixed. And here's the flaws that I think occur. Number one, I think basing the entire evaluation on standardized testing is a, is a huge mistake. When I interview a person for a job, I, I've never asked what they got on their SATs, <coughs> ever. I do like to see how they handle a question in an interview. I like to know whether they can work with other people as a team or not. I like to see if they're good problem solvers. I think the student evaluation should include standardized testing, but it shouldn't only include it. Now let me say this. I am not saying there should be more days of testing at it. I think there should be fewer days of testing. But I also think that the teachers and the administrators and the board members should have some other evaluation, some would call it subjective. Well, sometimes life is subjective. I think if a student can give a good oral report, that ought to count. I think if a student's a member of a good team and can do a science experiment, that ought to count. I think if the student can write a poem or a short story or a piece of music, that ought to count. So I think in evaluating a child's progress to look only at standardized test scores is a mistake, and I fix that. Number two, the way we evaluate special education is all wrong. And I'm sure there's a lot of districts and schools in this room that aren't making AYP because of special ed. Here's what I would do instead to fix it. Let me say parenthetically. I want every child with a disability to have the very best education possible for that child. I don't want to dumb it down or dial it back or do anything to hurt that child. I don't think there's any child should be told, oh, there's some limit beyond which you can't go. I wouldn't want to hear that from my daughters and I wouldn't want to hear it from other kids. Having said that, it is ludicrous to think that a child with a very low IQ is going to pass a test for which she can't read the instructions. It is ludicrous. And to hold that against the school is equally ludicrous. We have two federal laws colliding with each other. We have No Child Left Behind, which essentially says, test almost every child on the same test, irrespective of their cognitive capacity. And then we have another law, the IDEA, which says you have to have a special curriculum for every child is classified. The I in IDEA stands for individual. So here's what I would do. I would say that each year when the IEP is written between the child study team and the family, there should be a negotiated agreement as to what measurement the child will be measured against to find progress. In other words, I think the parents and the child study team want to say, we think the right goal for Mary or John this year is X. And if the school meets it, it makes AYP for that. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm not trying to breed more litigation. Lord knows we don't need that out of IDEA. But I think that's a better way to do this. If we're going to have an individualized curriculum for classified children, we ought to have an individualized measure of standard as to how they, they progress as well. Third thing, um, we need to have what's called longitudinal testing to evaluate whether kids are making progress. Here's the way I understood this. My children went to uh, elementary school and had nights. And we had very small classes in Atlantic Avenue School. We had maybe 18 or 19 children, which is a real asset. So here's what would happen. Let's say the third graders in year one all pass the math test. So the school reports 100% of children being confident in the math test. And the kids move on to fourth grade. Then the second grade moves up to third grade. And they have 19 kids, right? 20 kids all around them making the math easier. I'm not very good at math. And four of those children have some issues. Two of them come from a home where there's some, dis there's some disturbance and the child's a little bit rattled by it. And then two of them have some cognitive issues. And 16 kids pass the test and four do not. Well, according to the way No Child Left Behind is written now, the school would fail to make AYT because you went from 100 to an 80. But we're not measuring the same children. What we ought to be doing is measuring this year's fourth grade against how well they did last year in third grade. So you're measuring like children to like children. So this is another change I think that we need to make. And then finally, I think most importantly, um, the basic promise that was made when No Child Left Behind was enacted in 2002, and I supported it, was that the additional services that would be needed to help children in that bottom decile move up would be funded by the federal government. 
So whether it was summer school or reading tutors or technology or, or uh, other programs that the federal government would pick up through supplemental services, all of the tools necessary to make this happen, and we have fallen woefully short of that goal. So the four changes I would make, I would broaden the evaluative measure to include something other than the standardized test. I would change the way we measure special education students, not in any way, in any way um, depriving them, but having a more accurate measure of what they really have accomplished. I would switch to longitudinal testing so we're measuring children against themselves year to year, not against another group of kids. And I would fully fund the supplemental services so school didn't make it had a chance to do this. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go, since we're talking about um, IDEA, I want to go into the funding. Um, it seems that uh, the uh, House Appropriations Subcommittee would like to increase IDEA um, and Title I by a billion dollars on each of them. In, in order to do that, they want to eliminate all the competitive grants. The Senate does not want to increase them and they want to keep the grants in place. What's, what's your opinion on that? Well, Surprisingly, that's what I find the House version to be much more wise, <laughs> uh, as usual. And by the way, there's a saying in Washington when I first got there, as a Democrat, one of the senior Democrats said to me, you know, around here the Republicans are the opposition, but the Senate is the enemy. So there is a sort of an understanding here about the House and Senate, yeah. but let me say what I, why I think that the House proposal is better. Um, IDEA was not meant to be a competitive program where who comes up with the most new faddish idea to deal with special ed kids. It was meant to be a guaranteed revenue stream. Well, let me back up a second. Before 1974, the level of education that special education children got was entirely up to the local state. Pretty much did what you thought was best for that student. New Jersey, uh, happily, has long had a history of high quality education for all children. There were states where this is not true. Um, some kids were literally kept out of school. They were educated in broom closets. Uh, frankly, in the Jim Crow South, it was more often the children of color that were excluded and, and classified as, quote, retarded, which was the word of the day. And, and the law in 1974 was designed to make sure that there was a federal right for every child in every community to get a high quality education. I'm for that. But there was a promise made in 1974 that no less than 40% of the cost of providing that high quality education, no less than 40%, would be borne by the federal government. Today the percentage is 17%, and you're picking up the other 83. So I obviously favor anything that moves the number higher, and, and let me say, I don't, a billion that does very little, by the way, that's not much money. It is, but do you think there'll be some sort of compromise with, it won't go to a billion, but it might go to It'll something. probably go to six or seven hundred million okay. the way this works.